medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. We're going to talk about what's happening in China. And unfortunately, we do need an update on this because they are having a tremendous surge over there. They are saying up to 5,000 people are dying every day of COVID-19. This is a Reuters article that was published recently here on December 25th. Dr. Bernstein, who works over in the Beijing United Family Hospital, says that in working three decades of emergency medicine, he's never seen anything like this before. And this is very similar to what we saw happening in northern Italy at the beginning of the pandemic and also in New York right after that. He says that they are being inundated. The emergency room is being filled. They're not going anywhere. They're running out of oxygen in some places. And almost all of these are elderly patients and many of them unvaccinated. He says Bernstein's account reflects a similar testimony from medical staff across China who are scrambling to cope after China's abrupt U-turn on its previously strict COVID policies this month, which was followed by a nationwide wave of infections. It's by far the country's biggest outbreak since the pandemic began in the central city of Wuhan three years ago. Beijing's government hospitals and crematoriums have also been struggling, and you can actually see photographs of this in various news reports all over the internet. If you start looking, you'll see it. Hospitals are just overwhelmed from top to bottom. So what are the implications of this? What's going on over there? What is this variant being transmitted over there currently? Does it have any way of affecting us here in the United States? I think all these are really good questions, and we're going to delve into some of those topics in this update. So first of all, who are we? I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt. I'm the co-founder of MedCram.com. We are a website that is dedicated to explaining medicine clearly, primarily to healthcare professionals, but also to lay people. We offer continuing medical education that's being used all over the world in medical institutions and also on publishers. We have no agenda. We're not political. We're not paid by any pharmaceutical company. That is where we're coming from here. And I think this is really important what's going on here globally in China, not only from a human standpoint, also from a medical standpoint, and also an economic standpoint. So that's what we're going to talk about now. And I think to understand that better, you also have to understand what's going on in China in terms of the timeline. In late October of this year, there was a surge with a Omicron subvariant called BF7, and that's short for BA5217, which is a sublineage of the Omicron variant BA5. This one is quite transmissible. If you look at the regular Omicron, the R0, which is basically how many people on average does somebody infect when they come down with this virus, was about five for the regular Omicron variant. This BF7 variant is anywhere between 10 and 18.6 based on some reports. So it's extremely infectious. It's nowhere like the original strain of SARS-CoV-2. This thing is extremely infectious. The question is, is it more deadly? Is it more mild? Well, this is a really interesting discussion because we don't really know, is it the humans that are becoming better adapted at SARS-CoV-2? And that's why we're seeing better outcomes in general as time goes on. Or is it the virus that's actually becoming more mild? I think this will actually shed some light on what's going on. China is a little bit different from the United States and the rest of the world in how they dealt with this. They have something called a zero tolerance policy. Basically, if they find an outbreak, they shut that place down, they isolate them, and they make sure that nobody comes, goes, leaves, does any of that to make sure that it is limited to that area. And the officials that have been tasked with enforcing this face punishment if they are deemed to have failed in their response. So they are very motivated to make sure that people who have the disease are basically isolated. There have been some reports where some people have been in their apartment buildings for up to three months, not able to leave, and they have food delivered, all this sort of stuff. Very strict policy that was put in place in China probably since the very beginning of the pandemic three years ago. And it may be the reason why they've been so successful in preventing the virus from getting into areas that we hadn't seen it up to this point. And that may be a good thing or it may be a bad thing as we're about to find out. So all of this was going along until November 24th, when there was a major apartment fire in the city of Uyghur, where many died as the result of electric fire in the apartment building, and many were not able to get out of the building because either they were locked up or they didn't know where the escape exits were. And there's a lot of debate and controversy over that. But some people have claimed that the people were literally locked into their rooms and could not escape. 
So because of that, just a few days later, there were major protests in China over this zero COVID policy. So severe, in fact, were these demonstrations. I mean, people were basically sacrificing their freedom because if they were arrested for this, it could literally be years in prison. Regardless of that, there were major demonstrations over this zero COVID policy. On December 7th of this year, 2022, there was a major pivot by the government on this zero COVID policy, and there was a lot of relaxing of this. And within a week or two, there was a major surge. The surge had already begun even prior to this major relaxing. That's the reason why there were people that were getting infected. And as a result of this, there was just sort of like an opening of the floodgates when they relaxed this. Basically, they stopped these zero COVID policy enforcement measures and deaths started to go up and cases start to go up, as we saw here in the article at the beginning. The week of December 12th, China's National Health Commission stopped providing complete COVID-19 case counts this week. And that's why I really haven't shown you graphs because it shows that the cases are going up, but there's been no deaths. And yet we're getting photographs out of China showing corpses and coffins lining up. They've changed their definition, and it's really more political, so I don't even want to go over those numbers. What we do know is that China now is importing a tremendous amount of Paxlovid for the treatment of these patients that have gotten sick. And the question is, is well, what about vaccination? China says that up to 90% of their population has been vaccinated. Why are we seeing these sorts of things? First thing you need to understand is the differences between the U.S. and China. The least vaccinated population in China are the elderly. And unfortunately, these are the people that are the most susceptible to coming down with COVID-19 from SARS-CoV-2. There was never a push in China for the elderly to be vaccinated. First thing you should know is that there's no mandates for vaccines ever in China. It did not mandate the vaccination. They encouraged it. And if you look at the 60-year-old plus age group, 30% of those patients are not vaccinated. In the 80-year-old plus population, up to 60% are not vaccinated. This is very different than what we see in the United States, where at the beginning of the rollout for vaccination, it was healthcare providers and people over the age of 75, and then they moved down from there. So there was a big push to vaccinate the elderly in the United States, not so much so in China. And the other thing is that there's currently no mRNA vaccines in China. None have been imported from outside, and they don't have any mRNA vaccines being manufactured currently in China that is approved for use. There is a number of trials going on. In fact, Moderna even has a trial right now. But the vast majority of the ones that are actually being used and the ones that are approved, none of them are mRNA. When you look at the data between the different types of vaccinations, there was a study actually that was just published in The Lancet. There's a link to it below. Looking at the effectiveness, this was just done in Singapore, looking at three or four doses of the mRNA vaccine versus the inactivated whole virus vaccines, which are very popular in China against COVID-19 infection. What they found is that compared to three doses of the mRNA vaccines, whether it's Moderna or Pfizer, those that had the regular types, the inactivated vaccines in China, which is what they're using, had a 13% higher symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection, had 52% higher COVID-19 related hospitalization, and had 90% higher severe COVID-19. That's the difference that we're dealing with here when we're looking at the U.S. and China. First of all, your major population that is at risk for getting severe COVID-19 is your elderly patients, and they have a significantly less vaccination in China than they do in the United States and around the world. And then secondly, the vaccines that they did use in these populations have been shown to be not as effective at preventing the worst outcomes in these patients. But what about this BF7? BF7, as we talked about, is way more infectious than the regular strain of it. What is BF7 doing here, for instance, in the United States? Because it's already here in the United States. And you can see it here as this blue color. So as you can see here in September, it was a pretty small proportion of the total amount of SARS-CoV-2 in the United States. It's grown since September, probably to its peak here in October, November, but it's starting to actually get smaller and smaller here in the United States. So it is not dramatically taking over. There's other ones that we're looking at, like the BQ11, which we can talk about in another video. But in terms of the variant that is causing the surge in China, that very same one in the United States is not doing that at this point. 
Now, that's not to say that we don't have our own outbreak here in the United States, but I can tell you as a pulmonary and critical care specialist that works in the intensive care unit, while this winter has been relatively tough because of RSV and influenza and, yes, even a little bit of COVID, I have not seen anywhere near the amount of respiratory failure from COVID-19 that I saw, for instance, last summer and the winter of 2020 and 2021. Nowhere near that. We are not seeing anywhere near the amount of COVID that we were seeing before. And yet, when I see this article here in Forbes talking about China's massive COVID-19 surge may overwhelm healthcare system and negatively impact global economy, it's a deja vu for me. This is exactly the issues that we had here in the United States when we had that outbreak. We saw things like not enough hospital beds, running out of oxygen. Also saw that in India with the Delta surge. It's not just coming out of one or two news agencies. Radio Free Asia, which is known for its accurate reporting, is reporting that funeral homes in and around Beijing are operating around the clock amid these spike in COVID-19 cases and cremations now being backed up for at least five days. People have observed and photographs have shown long lines of vehicles at crematoria and cemeteries. Even Western media like the Financial Times, Reuters have been covering the acute crisis in hospitals, crematoria, and morgues. And you can read that at the link provided. I don't think this is manufactured. I don't think anyone's trying to fear monger or scare. I think this is actually something that's going on. And I believe, as this title in the Forbes magazine is telling us, that this could impact global economy. Why is that? Because a lot of things are manufactured in China. And whereas you can have the government shutting things down, as they did before, causing a supply chain problem, that can really be shut down fast when you have people that are sick, people that can't come to work, shops and things have shut down. One of the major manufacturing countries in the world with a population of over 1.4 billion, is now going through a surge. And I believe this is going to have supply side issues economically, and that can affect our ability to use pharmaceuticals, healthcare supplies, and a whole host of other things. Now, despite that, I would say that as a physician, I don't care what country this is happening in. I don't care what the leaders of that country's political slant is. These are human beings that are suffering viral illness. And as always, we at MedCram believe in the Swiss cheese approach. And so while I do believe that vaccination does have its role, it's simply one slice in the Swiss cheese model. There's many other slices that can help preventing yourself from transmitting the virus, but also preventing yourself from getting sick. To the degree that this message is being heard in China, there are things that I believe that you can do that don't necessarily belong in the supply chain, which is being stressed at this point. And while one of those things is vaccination, you can see here very clearly on the Texas Health and Human Services dashboard of the Texas Department of State Health Services, that data even through mid-November in the last 28 days with Omicron, we're still seeing that those that are unvaccinated are 14 times more likely to die of a COVID-19 associated illness than those who are vaccinated. I do believe that vaccination is a cornerstone, but I don't believe that that's the only slice that we can use. And we've talked about that here at MedCram. First of all, if you're concerned about getting COVID and you are listening to this in China, we do have a video on YouTube called 10 Tips If You Get COVID-19, where we talk about what you ought to be doing right away instead of waiting three or four days before you get sick and have to go to the hospital. I do believe, based on some evidence, and we'll talk more about this as the evidence is coming out in our video, A Case for Sunlight in COVID, it's not just vitamin D, but I believe that near-infrared radiation can actually help in preventing people from progressing along in COVID-19. And actually, we're going to be coming out with a video very shortly on a recent randomized controlled trial that showed that infrared radiation actually improved outcomes in COVID-19. I think it was very exciting and I'm putting that video together as we speak. We also did an update during the pandemic, Update 46 and Update 47, which talked about hot and cold therapy and its ability to modulate the immune system to the degree that it can actually speed up the killing of SARS-CoV-2 virus. And actually some pandemic data from over 100 years ago during the flu pandemic of 1918 and 1919 that showed that hot and cold therapy, otherwise known as hydrotherapy, could actually have a benefit in those patients as well.
And I say these things because this is exactly the type of treatment that is scalable. It doesn't require a diagnosis. It doesn't require a prescription. And it's very easy to scale this to treat hundreds of thousands, even millions of people very quickly. And that's why in addition to Paxlovid, in addition to making sure people are vaccinated, these things can be used in complement. These are not a substitute for the well-described benefits of vaccination and Paxlovid but can be used in complement to those sorts of things. And for those of you who are interested, I wanted to show you which are the vaccines that are currently approved for use in China. Protein subunit, protein subunit, non-replicating viral vector, non-replicating viral vector. Here's an inactivated, an inactivated, the Sinopharm one, and another inactivated and inactivated Sinovac. There are some clinical trials that are going on. Some of them are protein subunits. Here's a DNA, here's an RNA, another RNA or mRNA vaccine. Here's the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine as well by CanSino Biologics. Here's one by Pfizer, and you can see some of the other trials that are going on. So currently, there are no mRNA or DNA type vaccinations available in China. I also wanted to show you the different courses that we have at medcram.com. As you can see here, a lot of these are given continuing medical education credit. In particular, I want to show you one that was a paid course previously, but we have made it free for doctors and healthcare providers around the world that are ventilating patients for COVID-19. As you can see here, we made this course available for free to help describe how you should ventilate these COVID-19 patients. As you can see here, it was rated five out of five stars from over a thousand reviews that took this course. And here's one comment from a physician who wrote, I don't usually work with ventilators, but I wanted to learn something as I have recently started doing admission from the emergency room to all floors and units and may need to put initial settings. This course is excellent, and I feel I can with confidence start managing the patient from the emergency room until the intensivist in the unit or pulmonary take over. And that's exactly what the purpose of this course was, was to give some basic information to be able to treat patients once they get intubated for COVID-19. Here's another comment. Being a doctor on frontline and a surgeon, I always feel that this subject is difficult to be simplified and out of my area of expertise, but this course showed me that I was wrong. The course was simple, informative, interactive, and up to the point. Again, thank you for sharing this great material and looking forward for more. And he's currently working in the United Nations Assistant Mission in Afghanistan. Please join us at medcram.com for more information and continuing medical education. And until next time, thanks for joining us.